Chapter 5. Murderers Darn My Socks. Same day, Sunday, January 6, 1935. I keep thinking about when my mom's second cousin, Mrs. McGraw, came to visit. Put her in an asylum, Helen. It's the humane thing to do. Mrs. McGraw said between bites of cinnamon nut cake. My mom turned ashen. She told Mrs. McGraw she wasn't welcomed in our home ever again. Mrs. McGraw took giant gulps of air and tried to apologize, but my mom stood firm, holding the door open. She didn't say a word until Mrs. McGraw limped out, her handbag bumping against her side. After she was gone, my mom found Mrs. McGraw's knitting bag. She sent me running after her to give it back. I can't help if your mom can't see the forest for the trees. She's got one good boy. Why not focus on him? But no, she goes on these wild goose chases. It's too bad the child is sick, but cut your losses. No use throwing good after bad. I nodded then. I didn't mean to. Really, I didn't. My neck nodded without telling me to. But once I nodded, I couldn't unnod. I was too stiff to move. When Mrs. McCraw drove off, I still had her knitting bag in my hand. The thing is, we didn't do that, right? We didn't put her away. The Esther P. Marinoff will help her, right? When we get back, I tromp up the stairs to our apartment, wondering if Teresa's family has a radio that works. Then I see the note hanging from our door. Cam, send your boy up to talk to me at 1700 today. Warden Williams. The warden? I croak. My dad takes the note out of my hand. Looks like it, he says. Couldn't I do this tomorrow? When the warden says jump, my father says, you ask how high. Dad, we gotta talk. Give me a little time to rest, then we'll play ball, then you'll go. He winks at me. I don't remember ever seeing him look so tired. The extra guard duty shifts are killing him. It's too much work, and being a prison guard is the exact wrong job for him. He's too nice. My mother would make a much better jailer than my father. I've just finished my book when my father comes out of his room with his glove and a ball, and the ball in his hand. My mother is still sleeping. He closes the doors quietly as he can. Doc? He asks. Yep. I search for my glove. It's not in my room. Maybe it's in Natalie's. Lately, she decided the glove is hers. The door to Nat's room is closed. I can't bring myself to open it. I glance back at my dad. I'll get it, he whispers. From the doorway, I see Nat's soft purple blanket in a tangled heap. Why didn't my mom pack it? How will Nat go to sleep without it? I feel like marching into my parents' room and shaking my mom. How could you send her to that place without her blanket? My dad fi finds the glove on a crate by her bed. He puts it under his arm and heads for the door. Dad, what about her blanket? What if she needs it? I think your mom was worried it would get lost. He presses his lips together so hard they go white. None of, neither of us says anything as we walk down the stairs. The dock smells like sardines, and it's pretty deserted, unless you count the birds, which I don't because it makes me think about Natalie. We decide to throw parallel to, six, to 64 building, where we live. This way, if somebody misses, we aren't as likely to lose the ball in the bay or bust out any apartment windows. The gulls scatter to the dock posts and wood pilings at the water's edge. They sit watching us like fans. It's so nice to have my dad again. I was angry at him for looking for a job up here and angry all over again when he found one. I've been angry at my mom for making us do this and at Pete and all my friends at home because I had to move and they didn't. I've been mad at everyone except Natalie. I always try really hard not to get angry with, at her. Once, when I was little, I yelled at her for smashing a dugout I'd constructed out of cardboard, and my mom didn't speak to me for a month. My father told me having Natalie as a sister is like playing ball when you're a hundred times better than your opponent. You al you'll always win, but it will make you feel like a louse. I didn't see what that had to do with my sister ruining my stuff and my mother going mute, but it was pretty clear that getting mad at Natalie was the one thing that would never be forgiven. My dad's not a great ball player, but he's a lot of fun to throw with, because he's always trying something tricky. He sends a high ball I have to run like crazy for, then a fast glove pelting stinger, then a low burner. I know all his tricks. After a few minutes, when my arm is good and loose, I start talking. So, I ask, how long we here? My dad catches the ball and walks up closer so we don't have to shout. We live here now, Moose, you know that. But what if I don't wanna live here? He shrugs. Nobody wants to come to Alcatraz, but at least you don't have a number printed on your back and no bracelets either. Bracelets? Handcuffs. Oh, I send him an easy ball with a high arc. Natalie doesn't like it either. She doesn't like it one bit, I say, although I know this is a cheap shot. My father catches the ball and waits a beat before returning a stinger. I'm surprised how hard and fast it is. Stings my hand through the glove. 
If you want to talk about yourself, that's fine, but I'm not going to discuss your sister. Does the warden know? Does the warden know what? About Natalie. Of course. Well, what's he want to talk to me about then? Just wants to meet you as my guest. It's decent of him to take the time to talk to you, Moose. Have you met his daughter? Piper. Yes. Seems like quite a nice young lady. I blow air out of my mouth and roll my eyes. He laughs. The pretty ones are always trouble, Moose. But I think you can handle her. He winks at me. She told me she was going to tell the warden about Natalie. Like I said, he already knows. She wasn't nice, I say. Sounds to me like she was just trying to help her out her dad. No crime there. Tell me again why we can't go home? We saw where that was going, Moose. Natalie sitting on Graham's back step, counting her buttons day after day. We wanted to see, just see, if there was another way. This school has skilled teachers working with these kids around the clock. It's an impressive place. The goals are starting to edge closer now. I stamp my foot and they scatter. You saw how she was when we left. Change is hard. It's hard for you. It's hard for me. It's murder on your sister. His voice breaks. You heard her screaming, Dad. My dad's hands go up to block my words. Look, son, he interrupts. I can't talk about this anymore. I want to know for certain this is going to work out. My dad sighs. He looks out at the water to where they're building the bay bridge. Two toothpicks held together by a thread of steel. He's quiet for a long time. Nobody knows how things will turn out. That's why they go ahead and play the game, Moose. You give it your all, and sometimes amazing things happen, but it's hardly ever what you expect. Now, he checks his watch. You can't go see the warden looking like that. Go put on a clean shirt. I don't have one. Clean-er, then. We don't put the laundry out until Wednesday. Comes back Monday. Mom doesn't have to do it? He shakes his head. The convicts do the washing here. The convicts wash my shirts, as in murderer convicts and kidnapper convicts, and then I'm supposed to wear them? He laughs. They darn socks, too? Yes, as a matter of fact. Do a better job than your mom, too. Then don't you dare tell her I said that. Murderers out so my mother? Apparently so. My dad laughs. Chapter 6. Sucker. Same day, Sunday, January 6, 1935. I'm walking by the cell house now, row after row of dark barred windows, all spooky quiet. What goes on in there? I know the convicts aren't allowed to talk, but how could some 300 men not make more sound? Just breathing makes noise, you know? And all those windows? The cons don't sit around watching us, do they? Across the road from the cell house is a fancy mansion with flower pots on the steps and curtains in the windows. The only thing missing from the house is a lawn and a tree. That's the only tip. This is Alcatraz. There's nothing but cement clear up to the door. Even so, it's strange how one side of the road is so different from the other. High society on the left, grim and grisly on the right. But somehow, this seems like the perfect place for a piper. I trip going up the steps and have to brush myself off and tuck my shirt in again. I comb my hair with my hand, take a deep breath, and ring the bell. The door opens a split second later, and there's the warden, rising to fill the doorway. Young Mr. Flanagan, he says. Yes, sir, I say. Just making myself a cup of tea. Care to join me? No, sir. I mean, yes, sir. I want to join you, but no, sir. I don't like tea. The warden nods. He eyes, he, his eyes look me up and down. After a long minute, he gives up command of the entrance and motions me in. My library is upstairs. The door's open. You go on ahead. I take an uncertain step forward and peek in at the living room. The couches and chairs look perfect, like nobody's ever sat in them. It smells like ammonia, and there's opera music playing somewhere. This is not the kind of house where you can burp freely and run around in your bare feet. The warden's library is a big dark room with heavy red drapes, strong closed, and floor-to-ceiling books, the kind of off official volumes with thick indexes Natalie likes. The warden comes in after me and closes the door. He sets his teacup on his desk, settles into a huge winged desk chair, and begins to work. Sit down, Mr. Flanagan, he says without looking up from his ledger. He sounds annoyed, like I've flunked his first test. I sit down. My own, only my aim is a little off, and I clonk myself on the wooden arm of the chair. Ouch. I mean, ouch, sir, I say. His face gets red. His sharp eyes seem to poke into me. He leans back in his chair and opens his mouth to say something, but just as he does, someone knocks on the solid oak door. Yes, the warden calls. The latch slides open, and there is Piper. Her hair is curled, her dress is starched. She's wearing white, short socks and shiny white shoes. Piper, did you want to sit in? The warden asks, his big face shining. Yes, sir, she smiles sweetly. 
We'd be delighted, wouldn't we, Mr. Flanagan? The warden asks. Yes, sir. My throat closes around the words. The warden doesn't seem to notice, beaming as he is at her. Piper, you feel free to chime in now. Yes, sir. Piper smiles. She doesn't look at me. When convicts first arrive on Alcatraz, I speak with them personally, let them know what I expect. I don't usually talk to new civilians, but Piper felt I should make an exception in your case, the warden says. Oh, swell. I'm getting the convicted felon treatment. I try to look only at the warden, try not to notice Piper, but this seems impossible. Yes, sir, I say. I don't know what you did in Santa Monica, Mr. Flanagan, but children on Alcatraz follow the rules. Exactly, precisely, without exception. Isn't that right, Piper? Yes, sir, she says. We're a small town here, a small town with a big jail. The track record of convicts we have includes 79 successful escapes, 19 unsuccessful escapes, and 24 escapes that were planned but not carried out. That's before these men came to Alcatraz, of course. We've made certain there will be no escapes here, but I don't fool myself. These convicts are the very best at what they do. They have 24 hours a day, seven days a week to figure out how to get out of here. These are men who have been tried and convicted of the most heinous crimes imaginable. Terrible men, with nothing but time on their hands. He waits for this information to sink in. All I can think about is how stupid this is. If the men are that dangerous, why have women and children living on the island? I know my father says that in the event of a, of a break, the warden wants the guard the guard corps within walking distance of the cell house. And I know that the Alcatraz apartments are cheap compared to the cost of apartments in San Francisco. Still, it seems like an incredibly stupid idea to me. Yes, sir, I say. I have a great deal of respect for your father, and since you're Cam's boy, I bet you have a lot to offer. I'm looking forward to getting to know you, but before that can happen, we have to make sure we understand each other. Yes, sir, I say. We have rules here, laws you must obey, or you could endanger yourself and everyone else on this island. Rule number one, there's no contact with the convicts. You see them on work detail down at the dock. On occasion, they'll help a family move furniture or paint their quarters. He pulls open the curtain, and there's the cell house. The little hairs on my neck stand up at the sight of it so close. But, his voice goes low and hard, they are accompanied by a guard at all times. You may not, under any circumstances, approach them or speak to them. Women are not to wear bathing suits, shorts, or any attire that is anything but completely modest. Undergarments are not to be sent out with the laundry. He turns to Piper. Cover your ears, young lady. He beckons me with his finger. I walk up close and he whispers. Some of these convicts have not seen a woman in 10 or 15 years. You're old enough to understand what that means, Mr. Flanagan. Yes, sir, I say, almost running back to my chair. You can never trust a con. Nobody came here for singing too loud in church. Do you know what the word conniving means? Uh, sneaky, tricky, I say. That's right. Remember that, Mr. Flanagan. Conniving men with no sense of right and wrong. Oh, swell. Number two, do not enter an area that is fenced off. Number three, no visitors unless you've made your request in writing one week prior to the visiting day. Number four, do not speak to any outsiders about what goes on here. Don't go shooting your mouth off about Al Capone. You say his name and hordes of reporters come crawling out of the woodwork ready to write stories full of foolish lies, dangerous lies. Know anything about Capone, Mr. Flanagan? Uh, he's a gangster from Chicago, killed a lot of people on Valentine's Day. Al Capone was, some say is, the most powerful underworld figure in the country. Here on Alcatraz, he's in number just like every other con. The point of this prison is to keep these showy criminals out of the limelight. If I find you're out running your mouth about Capone, I'll ship you back to where you came from so fast it'll make your head spin. Would you please, I want to say. But then I think about my dad and how hard he's working so we can stay here. The warden's eyes flicker. He seems to sense his words haven't had the desired effect. I know you're going to want to give that sister of yours a chance at school. Please, sir, don't bring her into this, I say, looking down at the carpet. I can feel the heat of his intense blue eyes watching me. Fair enough, he nods. Number five, you must walk through the metal detector upon entering and leaving the island. No dogs, cats, or pets of any kind. No play guns, ropes, metal pipes, or anything that can be used as a weapon. No old hangers or nails or anything made of metal or glass goes out with your trash. These convicts can fashion weapons out of anything. Yes, sir, I say, the hair on, hairs on my arms so keen I could pick up radio signals with them. Now my daughter tells me she's introduced you to the other children here. He nods to Piper. Your, your daughter hasn't done boo. Far as I can tell, she's a bald-faced liar, I want to yell. Is there anything I miss, sweetheart? The school projects? Oh, yes, Piper is a straight-A student, he says, pretending to whisper. Oh, daddy, Piper blushes. Her mother and I are so proud, but sometimes keeping track of all the projects she has going on is a challenge for her. 
Annie and Jimmy both go to St. Bridget's, so you'll be the only other Alcatraz child attending Marina School with Piper, and she often needs help carrying her projects and whatnot to school. We are hoping, as a favor to us, you might be willing to help out. Emergency alert, emergency alert, Moose Flanagan played for a sucker right before his very eyes. Yes, sir, my voice squeaks high like a rodent's. I glance sideways at Piper. The warden's smile is kind. If you have any problems at all, my door is always open. Yes, sir. That is, or that's it, welcome to Alcatraz. You can see yourself out? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, I say. Bye, Moose. See you at school tomorrow. Piper waves like she's the sweetest girl next door. For a second, I almost believe her. That's how good she is. And then I realize she is the girl next door. The girl next door to Al Capone.